Hello dear students, welcome back to another video lesson. Today we shall be discussing chapter 17 which is about money and financial system. You will find this chapter in page number 205. Money is a current medium of exchange in forms of cash or amount in the bank accounts. And this money is a part of our daily life. So in this chapter we shall learn about the different aspects of money which are barter system of exchange, difficulties of barter system, historical origin of money, role of money, meaning or definition of money, role of banks, credits, and at the last we have the self-help group for the poor. Now let's start with the first topic which is barter system of exchange. So what is this barter system of exchange? Before the introductions of money, business or trade exchange was done through the exchange of commodities. So, barter system refers to the system of exchange where goods and services are exchanged directly for other goods and services. For example, Mr. A wants potatoes and he have wheat. And Mr. B wants wheat and he have potatoes. So, they will exchange their goods. Okay, so this was how barter system took place before the introductions of money. And this system was known as barter economy or CC economy where C stand for commodity. So it will mean commodity to commodity exchange. And this system was practiced during the early human civilization and it can be dated back to 6000 BC. The next topic is difficulties of barter system. Here we have two subtopics which are double coincidence of wants and lack of common unit of value. The first difficulty is double coincidence of wants. This system requires a double coincidence of one where a seller has to find someone who wants to buy what he has and the buyer must also have what the seller wants. So for example, seller wants to buy book and he has wheat and so to find someone who wants to buy wheat and also have books to exchange was very much difficult during this barter system of economy the next is lack of a common unit of value so the main disadvantage of this barter system was there was absence of a common unit in terms of which values of goods and services have to be measured for example a horse cannot be measured in terms of rice in the case of exchange between rice and horse but if there is common unit of value it will set up particular amount for the horse and different amount for the rice so these are some of the difficulties which were faced during the barter economy now let's move on to the next topic which is historical origin of money we can trace back the origin of money during the barter economy where the people use commodities as money. They use grains, cattle, tobacco etc. as money but because of many disadvantages like lack of double coincidence of ones, lack of a common unit of value, precious metals like gold, silver, copper etc. began to use as money. But even here, carrying a large sum of money and traveling from one place to another for trading purpose was not easy and it was unsafe to carry precious metals from one place to another. So this led to the introductions of paper money which we are using today. Nowadays, this paper money is issued by the central bank of a country and in India, we have the Reserve Bank of India, RBI, or the Central Bank of India, who issues currency notes on behalf of the government. And no other individual or bank or a business person are permitted to issue this currency. And also, no one can refuse to accept money as a mode of payment, and therefore, it is widely accepted as a medium of exchange. Next, Role of Money Money plays a very important role in the exchange of 
goods and services. In the economy where money is used, double coincidence of want is no longer needed as the person who wants to get anything can get it with money. He can sell the produce that he have in the market and after selling it, he can buy the things that he needs. He no longer have to wait or look for the person to exchange commodities. For example, a man wants to buy rice and he has sugar. So, he can sell the sugar in the market and with the money that he gets, he can buy rice. So unlike the old system where he have to look for the person who has rice and wants to buy sugar. After the introductions of money, large sum of money transactions takes place in a single day. In these transactions, goods and services are exchanged for money. Even money lending is practiced where the borrower promises to pay back the money in future. So this is the role of money. Now, next we will learn about the meaning and definitions of money. The word money is derived from the Latin word monida. This monida is a surname of the Roman goddess of Juno whose temple is at Rome and it was where the word money was coined. But we find that economists hold different opinions about the definitions of money so here we have three of them legal defining of money functional definitions of money narrow and broad definitions of money let's learn about them one by one the first is the legal defining money according to this definition money is anything what the law accepts as a medium of exchange in other words Anything that the government declares as money is accepted as a medium for the exchange of commercial purpose. Since money has the legal power to pay off the debts, no creditors can refuse to accept the money. So, these currency notes and coins are called as legal tender money. Second, functional definitions of money. So, according to this definition, Anything which is generally accepted as a medium of exchange in payment of debts and as a payment of goods and services is called money. Here, in these functional definitions of money, it is mainly focused on the basis of the functions which money performs. Here, types of functions are like medium of exchange, measure of value, standard of deferred payments, store of value, etc. And here, Crowther's definition of money is considered as the best definition and he says that anything that is generally accepted as a means of exchange at the same time acts as a measure of a store of value is defined as money. The third is narrow and broad definitions of money. Narrow definitions of money is based on the medium of exchange. Here, it includes currency notes and coins and broad definitions of money includes currency notes and coins but it also includes deposits at banks and post office under the same topic of the definitions or the meaning of money let's look into the kinds of money even here the kinds of money are divided into three standard money bank money and near money let's discuss about them one by one first is standard money this standard money is also called as legal tender money as no one can refuse to accept it. Standard money is also again divided into two types which are paper notes and coins. And these paper notes and coins are together called as currencies. And these currencies are again called as fiat money as it acts under the order of the government. Here fiat means order. Again, the coins are further divided into two types which are full-bodied coins and token coins. In case of the full-bodied coins, the coins are equal to its metallic value. For example, gold coins and silver coins were full-bodied coins when the world were in the gold standard or silver standard time. During the British period, one rupee coin was made of silver and it was equal to its value as commodity. And in the case of token coins, token coins or trade coins are coins like object 
which are used instead of the coins. For example, money is exchanged for the token coins or chips in the casino or at the casino cage or at the gambling table or at the slot machine. So now next we have the bank money. Those money which can be withdrawn through bank check or bank draft are called bank money. Anyone who has deposited money in the bank has the right to withdraw it as well. These deposits can also transfer through check from one person to another. This bank money is also called as fiduciary money as checks are accepted by the people on the basis of trust. But unlike the standard money, a person can refuse to accept check as a means of payment. And in the third place, we have near money. Near money consists of highly liquid assets which are not cash but can easily be converted into cash. For example, saving accounts, foreign currencies, money market accounts, treasury bills, etc. This money cannot be used as a medium of exchange directly. They needed to be first converted into demand deposits and then only it can be used. Next, role of the banks. So now we will learn what are the role of banks. Bank accepts demand deposits. Here demand deposits means a deposit of money that can be withdrawn from the bank anytime without giving prior notice to the bank. So now the question is, what do the banks do with the deposits they accept from the public? After the depositors deposit some amount of money in the bank, the bank keeps certain amount of cash with them, say about 15%, as there will be some people who will be coming to withdraw cash from the bank. So many people does not come at once to withdraw large amount of money. Right. So they can easily manage with some small portion for their withdrawals. And also what about the other 85%? What they do is, they give loans to the borrowers and runs it in interest. The interest rate of the depositors are very less, but the interest rate of the borrowers are high. So the interest rate which comes from the borrowers are the main source for the income of the bank. Next, we have credits. Credit plays a very important role in the economic development of a country. Here, credit refers to an agreement between the lender and the borrower of money, goods or service with the promise to make payment in the future. These credits help the borrowers to fulfill his expenses during his need. We can take the example, a person takes credit and then complete his production on time and thereby it increases his income as well. Now, what we see is that in the rural areas, credit comes from farmers. They take loans in order to fulfill the expenditures on seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, water, electricity, repair of equipment, etc. So the farmers usually take loans from the creditors during the beginning of the season and repay him back after harvesting but in many cases it doesn't happen this credit may also lead a person to debt trap here what happened is that if there is a crop failure it is difficult for the farmer to repay back his loan and so it will let him to sell a portion of his land to pay off his debts so this is how credits takes place and now we will learn about some of the terms of credits Every loan agreement specifies interest rate to be their principles. So when a person is taking loan from the money lender, he keeps some security deposits in the hands of the money lender. It can be either land, vehicles or livestock. And if the borrower fails to pay back the loans with interest, the money lenders take over the security deposits. So this interest rate, collateral and documentation requirement and the mode of payments are all taken together as the terms of credits and even in the credit there are two forms of credit which are formal financial institution and informal financial institution the first is formal financial institution so this formal financial institution refers to those institutions whose financial transactions are governed by 
a set of rules and regulations. Some of the best examples for this formal financial institution are cooperative banks and commercial banks. Here in this formal financial institution, the Reserve Bank of India plays a very important role as it controls and regulates the activities of the formal financial institution. This RBI keeps track on whether the banks of India are keeping minimum portion of deposits to meet the cash requirement of the depositors. So earlier, I have also told you about the banks keeping aside 15% of the cash deposits, right, in order to meet the demand of the cash withdrawal. And the RBI also check whether the banks are giving loans to the priority sectors, which means the small farmers, artisans, small borrowers, etc. on concessional rate of interest. And these banks are also required to keep updates of their business activities to the RBI. The advantages of formal sector loans are it is much cheaper as the interest rates remain around 8 to 12 percent per annum which means per year and also the mode of payment of these loans are very easy. Formal credits save the borrowers from falling into debt trap and also many people can borrow these loans for a cheap interest rate for different purposes example a farmer can borrow money in order to grow crops unemployed youth can set up small scale industries or can trade in goods so in short these formal sectors of loan are cheap and affordable which is very much important for the, the country's development and now we will learn about the commercial bank so commercial bank plays a very important role in the modern economic system as they promote saving and the source of credit for trade and industry this commercial bank is created on the basis of giving more loans to people in low interest and advance their cash instead of reserving it so the meaning of commercial bank is that a commercial bank is a financial institution which accepts deposit from the public and gives loan for the purpose of consumption and investment. Here there are two essential functions which the financial institution have to perform in order to become a commercial bank. The first one is acceptance of demand deposits that have check facilities and lending. So, in order to become a commercial bank, this institution needs to accept check deposits as well as give loans or credits. Then only it will be termed as commercial banks. For example, post office saving banks are not commercial banks as it does not provide loans to the people but only accepts checkable deposits. And also in the same manner, Life Insurance Corporation of India, Unit Trust of India, Industrial Development Bank of India, etc. These are also not a commercial bank. Even though they give loans to the people, they do not accept checkable deposits. So they are also not considered as commercial banks. Some of the examples for these commercial banks are State Bank of India, Punjab National Bank, Allahabad Bank, Kanara Bank. These are some of the examples. These banks accept checkable deposits as well as give loans or credits and create demand deposits. In order to sum up the above given explanation, we can say that it accepts deposit from the public and these deposits can be redrawn by check and are repayable on demand. It gives loan or credit to the people and also the main aim of this commercial bank is to earn profit. So, they charge high interest rate to the borrowers and gives less interest rate to the depositors. And this commercial bank creates demand deposits which serve as a medium of exchange. Informal financial institutions So, there are many financial institutions which are not regulated or controlled by any authority. And they are indigenous bankers, moneylenders, traders, relatives and friends, cheat fund, finance company, etc. So these indigenous bankers include those individuals and private firms which receive deposits and give loans and they act as a mini bank and these are mainly found in the urban areas. And the money lender give loans to small borrowers like farmers, agricultural laborers, 
mine workers or low paid staff etc these money lenders do not accept deposits but only give loans and it is mainly found in rural area cheat funds are the saving institutions here for example five members created a group where they contribute around 1000 rupees each month so they will take this money in turn wise the first month one member will get 5000 rupees including his or her deposits so just like that it will continue with other members as well so it will function within the members of the group and thus we see that the informal money lenders are not supervised by anyone so they decide their own interest rate and also use unfair means to get their money back and these money lenders also charge high rate of interest comparing to the formal institution and so in some cases when the borrower is supposed to give back the money the interest rate is higher than the actual amount of money that was borrowed and for these reasons two things are highly needed first one is the cooperative banks need to give more loans and the second is there must be someone who would regulate control and monitor the functions of the informal institution the next subtopic is relative importance of formal and informal credit here we will study about the importance of formal and informal credits in both rural and urban areas so we find that about 85 percent of the loan taken by the poor household in the urban areas are from the informal source if we compare it to the rich household only about 10 percent of the rich household takes loans from the informal source and the rich household mostly take loans from the formal source and so they can fulfill all their needs and requirements and this is similar even in the rural areas where rich avail more cheap credits and the poor rural household avail less cheap credits and even after availing from the formal source it meets only half of their demands or their needs and so the remaining credit is made from the informal source which carries high rate of interest so this is why necessary banks and cooperative banks should increase their lending towards the people so that the people will reduce the dependence on informal source and also the formal credits needs to be distributed to the people equally the next topic is self-help groups for the poor like i have said earlier the poor household mostly depend on informal source of credits and it is because banks are not found everywhere in rural areas and also bank loan requires proper documentation and collateral here collateral means security deposits and moreover money lenders in the villages are willing to give or lend money without security deposits but at the same time these money lenders are indulged in various malpractices such as manipulations of loan records extracting forced laborers from the borrowers and charging high rates of interest and so a new set of organization came into being called self-help groups and this group usually have 15 to 20 members the members of the group saved from rupees 25 to 100 and taken a well small amount of loan from the group with a reasonable rate of interest and if they continue to functions properly they become eligible for bank loan as well these self-help groups decides regarding the loans the purpose and the amount interest rate and mode of payment and if any of the member fails to pay back the loans the case is seriously taken up by other members because because of their features of regularity the banks are willing to give loans even without collateral and in this way self-help groups help the borrowers to overcome their problems or lack of security and help them become self-reliant and moreover the self-help group also provide platform for the members to discuss and act on the numbers of social problems such as health nutrition domestic violence etc so in this lesson we have learned about the importance of money and financial system the origin of money about the barter system before the origin of money 
and also the importance of credits, the two types of credits, informal and formal. And with this, we have come to the end of our lesson. See you in the next video. Till then, stay safe.